Assalamu alaikum. And of course, happy Savior's Day. Uh, beloved brothers and sisters, as always, we will begin with a quick prayer. Shortly after this prayer, we will have a very brief video montage that we would like to uh, show you as we proceed with the program. So at this time, let us all please stand for a brief prayer. You may follow me silently. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of this day of judgment. Thee alone do we serve and thee alone do we seek for help. O Allah, guide us on the straight path, the path of those whom thou hast bestowed favors, not the path of those whom thy wrath is brought down upon, nor of those who go astray. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're going to uh, direct your attention to the screens as we have a very important and powerful and short video montage to get us prepared for this plenary session. Let us begin. I know it's difficult for us to wrap our minds around wickedness so great that people would plot to get the country into war at the expense of young patriotic men and women. But this is exactly what has happened the U.S. Maine was a lying wonder. World War I, the lies told. World War II, lies told. Vietnam, lies told. And here, 9-11, the World Trade Center destroyed. Nine eleven was very, very strange. Nineteen Muslims were put before the American public and the world two days after this heinous attack. But before this, the neocons that were surrounding President Bush said that America needed something like Pearl Harbor to summon the American people in their anger and horror over what happened. 9-11 was America's new Pearl Harbor. We just saw on live television as a second plane flew into the second tower of the World Trade Center. Now, given what has been going on around the world, some of the key suspects come to mind, Osama bin Laden. Now, there are too many strange things that uh, we question. Five of the 19 so-called terrorists are alive and well in Saudi. It takes uh, a lot of training and expertise to fly a uh, complicated, sophisticated uh, aircraft, whether it's a Boeing 737 or a smaller Airbus. These are not uh, little Cessnas and little Pipers. How does a pilot that failed his lessons on a one-engine propeller plane pull off maneuvers only a highly trained airline pilot could do. In Pennsylvania, Flight 93, only a smoking hole in the ground, no bodies, no seats, no wings, no luggage. 
Can you give us any better idea of how much of the plane actually impacted the building? You know, it, it, it might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage, nothing like that anywhere around, which would indicate that the entire plane crashed into the side of the Pentagon. Scientists have said that the amount of heat from the fuel in the planes could never melt steel. We heard a very loud blast and explosion. We looked up and the uh, building literally began to collapse before us. Those buildings fell in free fall, like you see implosions that are controlled demolition. There was no plane that attacked the third tower, but it too fell. Huh? Something is wrong with that picture. No steel frame building before or since 9-11 has ever collapsed due to fire. There has to be in the future some real independent investigation of 9-11. Today our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. This was the beginning of a war against Islam. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. There we go, there we go. Once again, happy Savior's Day. Go ahead and give yourselves a well-deserved round of applause for being with us today. We are truly, truly grateful and thankful to Allah, to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and certainly to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for making truth known in a world that is bent and determined to hide the truth from the masses of the people. Well, brothers and sisters, we are participating in an extremely important plenary session, one that uncovers the war on Islam, 9-11, revisited, uncovered, and exposed. I'm Brother Ilya Rashad Mohammed, and I am truly, truly honored to be facilitating this uh, very important plenary session during this Savior's Day. Now, as you all know, in previous years, we have uh, dealt with this subject before. It was our 2012 plenary session where we had the likes of Mr. Gage with us. But this topic is perhaps more important and more relevant now than ever before because the events of the 9-11 attacks and the subsequent laws and policies that were passed literally impacted America and the world like never before. As you recall, policies like the Patriot Act were enacted that literally affected the liberties and freedoms of the American people, particularly the Muslim community. We know that after 9-11 and all that blame was placed on Muslims, that both domestic and foreign policies were put in place, policies that were intended to thwart the progress of Islam and limit the activities of and now, during this heightened age of Islamophobia, we hear this uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric taking place all the way from the highest office of the United States. So I think that a subject like this is due again, don't you? All praise is due to Allah. So the truth 
has to be exposed. We have to continue to uncover the lies and the liars. So we're fortunate today to have those joining us who can offer not some theories, but who can offer us empirical data, scientific facts, and some plain old common sense to get to the bottom and expose the real culprits behind this global scheme. We have with us today the likes of Dr. Kevin Barrett, who's going to be presenting on the history of false flag attacks. Awesome. We have again with us Mr. Richard Gage, who will be presenting on the science of the collapse of the World Trade Centers. And we have, of course, with us that investigative journalist, Mr. Christopher Bolin. Mr. Bolin is going to pinpoint the Israeli and Jewish involvement in 9-11. So this is a heavy, heavy set that we have with us today. Now, after, after these presentations, we will be taking questions from the listening and the viewing audience, questions that will be presented to our panelists. You are encouraged to post both your questions and comments via social media using the hashtag um, War on Islam. Again, that's hashtag War on Islam. And we have with us uh, our brother, uh, that general of the Farrakhan Twitter army, brother uh, Jesse Muhammad, who will be with us, who will be channeling those questions up toward the stage for our panelists. So make sure that you are posting and tweeting via social media uh, so that we can get those questions and comments to our panelists. And now, we want to prepare to hear from our presenters. Our first presenter is an ally in our efforts to expose the truth behind what really happened during those 9-11 attacks. He'll present, be presenting on an important po topic that most journalists, whether deliberately or not, for some reason don't tend to talk about. We're talking about Dr. Kevin Barrett here. Let me give you a little bio on uh, Dr. Barrett. He has a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies and he holds advanced degrees in English, French, and African literature. He's the author of three books, including Questioning the War on Terror, which literally just deconstructs this whole notion of the war on terror. Consequently, he was blacklisted from teaching at the University of Wisconsin since 2006. He is one of the best known critics of the war on terror, and he's here to give us an insightful history of false flag attacks. Help me to receive to the podium, brothers and sisters, this scholar and historian, Dr. Kevin Barron. Let's welcome him to the stage. Assalamu alaikum. Happy Savior's Day. And thank you all so much for coming here and for being a part of this incredibly important event and for being a part of this incredibly important group, the Nation of Islam, which is standing up for truth and justice in such a powerful way. So my presentation today is about false flags. And I've picked sort of the top 10 examples to introduce the topic, uh, going back through history and leading up to where we stand today. So we need the first, we need to get to the slides, uh, whoever's controlling the slide panel. Okay, we'll have it up in, in just a moment. Uh, let, me, let me begin with a short, definition of a false flag. The first question people ask is, well, what does that mean, a, a false flag? It comes down to us from a, a naval uh, historical uh, discussion of attacks in which one ship would attack another ship flying the wrong flag, pretending to be somebody else. 
And a concise definition might be a horrific staged event blamed on an external enemy and used to, to create or exacerbate violent conflict and consolidate power. Well, this is my, uh, my most recent book, Orlando False Flag, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to the, these recent false flags, but let's go back in history now to 9-11. On September 11th, 2001, the only people who knew what false flag meant were the people in the military strategies academies who teach about them there. But the rest of us probably didn't even know what that term meant. So let's do a quick historical recap of the false flag in history. Top 10. <laughs> Number 10 in our list is all back to the Roman Empire. In 64 AD, the Emperor Nero was, according to some accounts, uh, responsible for the burning of Rome. He famously fiddled while Rome burned, and some historians say he did it himself. He then blamed the Christians, which launched the first great persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. And that set the pattern for what we'll see as a, a number of these incidents in which religious groups were blamed. One of those, a very famous one to those who study false flags, was the so-called gunpowder plot of 1605 in London. That is still celebrated every November 5th in the United Kingdom, in, in England. It's Guy Fawkes Day. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Every November 5th, people in, in England burn uh, Guy Fawkes in effigy. Guy Fawkes was the patsy who was blamed for planning to blow up the Parliament building. But he, he actually was set up to do that by Robert Cecil, a, an advisor to the throne who wanted to launch a war against Catholics. So they said that this evil Catholic radical, Guy Fawkes, was going to blow up the parliament, and they arrested him and executed him and created anti-Catholic propaganda, very much like today's anti-Islamic propaganda. And they used this propaganda to persecute Catholics in England and to launch wars against Spain and Portugal. And this was how the UK, that's how England, built its global empire on the back of this monstrous false flag. Well, let's fast forward a bit because we have limited time here. Uh, number eight on my list of top 10 false flag case studies is the incident of the USS Maine, which blew up in Havana Harbor in 1898, launching the Spanish-American War, in which the United States stole all of Spain's colonies from Cuba, Puerto Rico, over to the Philippines. This explosion was blamed on Spain. But today, all historians agree that Spain had nothing to do with that explosion. It uh, was discovered in the uh, 1990s by a commission led by Admiral Rickover that the explosion that blew up the main came from inside the ship. And though there's no absolute proof as to who did it, we can surmise that the war party that was looking for an opportunity to attack Spain, a weaker country, and steal its colonies was responsible. In 1915, just uh, less than 20 years later, public opinion in the United States was prepared for entry into World War I by the destruction of the Lusitania, a passenger ship loaded with armaments and sent straight into the path of the fleet of German U-boats that sank it. And once again here, we have spectacular images of destruction used to inflame people's passions, whip up anger and hatred against a scapegoated enemy, in this case, Germany, 
and prepare the ground for war. Okay, number six on our top 10 list, we're moving right along, is of course Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941, as President Roosevelt said, it, it's a day that would live in infamy. Even more infamy if you realize that President Roosevelt and his people were actually somewhat complicit in this. That is, there was an eight-point plan drawn up by the Roosevelt administration to make sure that Japan would strike first. And they broke the Japanese codes, they knew the attack was coming, and instead of protecting their people, they left 2,000 Americans out there on those exposed, old, obsolete, mothballed battleships to die as a kind of human sacrifice to the gods of war. This resulted in American public opinion swinging wildly from 80 or 90 percent against entry into World War II to virtual unanimous war fever. Pearl Harbor was, in fact, the model for 9-11. During the run-up to 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld handed out books about Pearl Harbor to everyone he met. He handed out hundreds, perhaps even more than a thousand copies of the book uh, Pearl Harbor, I think it was Day of Decision by Robert, uh, Roberta Wolstetter. So he, he was preparing the ground. Hollywood prepared the ground. Hollywood put out its Pearl Harbor movie that summer. And in so many ways, it was set up so that as soon as 9-11 happened, the mainstream media was chanting Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, almost in unison. Okay, let's move up to number five on our list of top 10 false flag case studies, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. In 1964, President Johnson uh, presided over a fake attack on a U.S. vessel. And although this incident did not provide us with spectacular images to whip up popular hatred and hysteria, it did provide us, or provide the perpetrators, with huge front page headlines. North Vietnam attacks American ship. And this was what paved the way to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which brought the U.S. into Vietnam in a huge all-out way. And the result was two million, some say three or four million Vietnamese murdered for a ridiculous lie. Just a few years after that, the same American president, Lyndon Johnson, who, by the way, was almost certainly complicit in the assassination of his predecessor, John F. Kennedy, presided over yet another false flag. And this was a much more lethal one, the attack on the USS Liberty. This was done by Israel, but it was designed to be blamed on Egypt. This was during the, the 1967 war. So June 1967, Israel has attacked its neighbors in order to steal the territory that has now become the so-called occupied territories. And Israel did this, launched this war of aggression with the help and complicity of President Lyndon Baines Johnson. This incident in which the Israeli uh, fighters, uh, both the, they had uh, boats and planes, uh, the planes strafed and uh, destroy, virtually destroyed the USS Liberty, killing 34 American sailors and wounding uh, nearly, what, 170, 180. This event was designed to bring the United States into the 1967 war on the side of Israel. And according to some accounts, including Peter Hunnam's in the book Operation Cyanide, this plot was actually designed to allow the United States to drop nuclear bombs on Russian military installations in Egypt. And had those sailors on the USS Liberty not succeeded in putting out their message that it was the Israelis who attacked them, we very well might have seen an all-out nuclear war back in 1967. So the exposure of a false flag, in this case by those heroic sailors on the Liberty, may have prevented untold destruction. Well, if you look at the USS Liberty here on your left and compare it to the hole in the USS coal on your right, you'll see uh, it, it looks quite similar, doesn't it? The USS Cole was one of these pre-9-11 false flags. That is, 
there were a number of terror incidents during the 1990s that paved the way for 9-11. These false flags were designed to set up Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda as a plausible patsy, that is, to implant the idea in our minds that Al-Qaeda was capable and willing to stage huge attacks on America. But in fact, the Yemeni government investigation of this incident reported that it was an American false flag, that is, that the Americans were responsible for attacking their own ship. Um, and, and there were several other 1990s false flags as well that paved the way to 9-11, including the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, which was done by the FBI. The FBI informant who arranged that bombing actually recorded a conversation with his FBI handler, and he said to his FBI handler, why didn't you guys give us a, a fake bomb like you promised? <laughs> Uh, and this was even reported in the New York Times, but somehow uh, that information has been suppressed ever since. Uh, there were also attacks on the U.S. embassies in Africa uh, as well. So 9-11 happened, and we'll get to that in a moment with the other speakers, but now I'm going to call, I'm going to lump together all of the false flags that have happened uh, since 9-11 and and targeted Muslims and used Muslim patsies uh, as a sort of one series of events, partly because there are so many of them uh, and they come one after another, it's hard for us to actually look at one of them hard enough and study it intensely enough to understand what happened with that one. And just as we're doing that, another one happens and they keep us in confusion. So I've been trying to keep up with these events, and I've edited three books about them. These three books on the screen, We Are Not Charlie Hebdo, Another French False Flag, and Orlando False Flag. And these three books bring together 55 leading public intellectuals, including many uh, quite prominent ones. Uh, Rabbi Michael Lerner is in the first book. He's America's most famous liberal Jewish political pundit. Uh, and he's actually a friend of Hillary Clinton, believe it or not, and he's in the book. Ajamu Baraka is in the second book. He was the Green Party's vice presidential candidate this year, and the media tried to manufacture a scandal about him being in this book. Uh, so and we have a number of former CIA people and so on as well. Very high-level people are helping expose these false flags. And these include the attacks in Paris in two 2015, we had this cartoonists who were killed by radical Muslims uh, we had in, in uh, January 2015. We had the follow-up attack in Paris in November 2015. Uh, and then we've, we've had a number of others, most recently here in the United States, the biggest one being this Orlando event uh, back in June. All of these events have certain things in common that allow us to identify them pretty quickly as probable false flags. And this is what you have to keep your eyes open for. Well, first, uh, what, what, what purpose does this serve? Uh, what, the, the timing, is, it, is there a political uh, purpose for this to happen right now? Like, for instance, the Charlie Hebdo attack happened at the perfect time to derail France getting friendly with Palestine, among other things. Uh, another thing we have to ask ourselves, is, uh, is there evidence that the patsy that they're blaming was set up too quickly? Did he drop an ID card at the scene, as almost always happens, and so on and so forth. So the, these are two key factors, sort of timing and who benefits, and is this patsy affiliated with intelligence services? Did he drop an ID card, and so on. Okay, let's get into quick uh, some details about the Charlie Hebdo attack. We know this was a false flag because there's a fake shooting that happened in front of the Charlie Hebdo magazine offices. Uh, you can find this video uh, on the internet. It was widely spread as propaganda against evil Muslim terrorists. But in fact, if you look closely at this video, you'll see that it's not a real shooting. The guy is being supposedly shot in the head with an AK-47 from point blank range, and his head is unaffected by that. But the media still tells us that's how this guy died. Uh, these patsies drop their IDs and their passports everywhere. 
It happened on 9-11. Magic passports floated down from the trade towers. They showed up next to the hole in the ground in Shanksville where Flight 93 supposedly just disappeared into the ground, leaving no evidence, no, no wreckage. Uh, so ID cards, you, you, if they identified the alleged perpetrator instantly from a dropped ID card, that's a sign. Um, this was the only picture after, uh, of any dead bodies after the uh, uh, November 2015 massacre in Paris. And it was tweeted into existence for propaganda purposes by an Israeli source affiliated with a neoconservative think tank here in the United States. And this is an example of how Israeli-linked people are showing up at almost all of these incidents putting out propaganda. The same Israeli-linked uh, photographer propagandist Richard Guchar was there in Nice as a truck began to run people down uh, last year. And then he showed up one week later in Munich, Germany, uh, taking pictures of the shopping mall Islamic terrorist event. So the same guy was right there, pre-positioned on a balcony to film the truck, and then he showed up one week later right in front of the shopping mall where the so-called radical Muslim terrorists started shooting. Uh, he's married to a high-level Israeli operator, a woman named Einet Wilf. Uh, and this is just one example of the countless examples of we find Israeli propagandists prepositioned to publicize these events. In terms of timing, the Orlando massacre happened just at the moment that we had spent a whole week celebrating the memory of one of the greatest Americans of all time, Muhammad Ali. A whole week. The mainstream media, the whole, all of America was standing strong and remembering this great Muslim freedom fighter. And then the Orlando massacre happened and the propaganda message, evil radical Muslims hate gays and kill them, became the, the new message that wiped out our memory of that wonderful week of remembering Muhammad Ali. So that's another example of how timing is very important in figuring out when there are false flags. So these are my three books uh, on the recent false flags, and they are available uh, in the back at the book table. Again, it's not just me. There are 55 leading public intellectuals in, the, in these three books, many of them essentially whistleblowers from the military and intelligence communities who are fed up with this nonsense and want it to end and are on our side in trying to make it end. And many of those people will come and speak to your groups and tell you the truth about these things. People like Robert David Steele, a CIA case officer who actually arranged a false flag for the CIA. The details are still classified, but he's leading the charge in exposing these things today, and there, there are many others as well. Well, my countdown of these top 10 false flag examples has led to what we have to call really borrowing language from Saddam Hussein, the mother of all false flags, 9-11. And I call it that not only because it set the stage for all of these other false flag events blamed on Muslims, but also because it had more visceral, emotional, political impact on the world than really any other single staged event in history. That is, the whole world saw this. The whole world was powerfully affected by this. And indeed, you could say that the whole world was brainwashed by it. So there's an African proverb that says, if you're lost, go back to where you were before you were lost. And that's what we need to do with 9-11. We're lost in this maze <laughs> of Islamophobia, of wars, of violence, of hatred, of divisiveness. And it's just getting worse. We need to go back to this moment that, as the mainstream media keeps telling us, changed the world and obviously changed it for the worse. And to go back to 9-11, we need to go back to the facts, the truth, the reality about what happened on 9-11 and shred that public myth. And those facts are, have been carefully gone over and scrutinized and developed and put together by so many people. There's hundreds, thousands of scholars and researchers 
who've helped us understand the truth about 9-11, which we do understand pretty well by now. And one of the leaders of that movement is here with us. Actually, two of the leaders of that movement are with us right now. The next one that I'm going to introduce is Richard Gage of Architects and Ar Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Uh, uh, oh yes, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let someone else uh, introduce Richard. Uh, I, again, I'm Kevin Barrett, uh, and my books on false flags, and especially recent false flags, are in the back. Thank you so much for coming out and contributing to the spread of truth and justice. Keep up the great work. Kevin, get the, give me the thing. Once again, let's hear it for Dr. Kevin Barrett. Excellent presentation. Excellent, excellent. Now that we know something about the history of these false flags and the characteristics thereof, is it likely that another type of false flag is being devised to justify another war, another policy, another political objective? Let's definitely keep that on our mind as we prepare to bring on our next presenter. Now, as you know, our next presenter certainly is no stranger to us. Mr. Richard Gage, who is an architect of nearly 30 years and the founder and CEO of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. This is a group comprised of skilled architects and engineers nearing about 2,500, if I'm not mistaken, along with 20,000 other uh, signers of the petition uh, and supporters that they have backing them up. Now be mindful, these are scientists, architects and engineers with verified degrees and backgrounds and experience who know what they're talking about. So after his 2012 plenary session uh, presentation to us, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan called this man a true patriot. So. He's here with us again today to take us further into the science of the collapse of the World Trade Centers. Let's welcome back to the podium our friend, our ally, Mr. Richard Gage. Let's welcome him again, family. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We erected a third light beam in downtown Lower Manhattan to bring to the attention of the American people World Trade Center Building 7, the third skyscraper that collapsed on 9-11. I want to tell you about it. Why? Because it collapsed suddenly, symmetrically, at freefall acceleration on the afternoon of 9-11 with by normal office fires, according to the official story. Here's a 47-story skyscraper be the tallest building in most of our states, part of the World Trade Center complex across the street from the complex itself. It wasn't hit by an airplane. Yet on the afternoon of 9-11, well after, seven hours after the two Twin Towers came down, it collapsed. According to the official story, by these small, few, scattered fires normal office fires. Office fires have never brought down a skyscraper. There are hundreds of examples of much hotter, longer lasting, and larger fires in skyscrapers that have never come down. There's good reasons for that. We're going to compare Building 7's features of its collapse to those of typical controlled demolition, beginning with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Let's listen to Dan Rather. This building collapses in under seven seconds in the manner that you see. I don't think that sound. What caused its collapse? Is there a straight down, symmetrical collapse? Another feature, number two, of controlled demolition. Let's take a look from West Street. Yep, straight down, symmetrically, into its own footprint. As you can see here, the center of the pile is in the center of the building. But maybe we're not convinced yet. Let's place a normal controlled demolition on the right, compare it to World Trade Center 7 on the left. Is there any similarity? 
Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Yet this was never done. How do they bring a building straight down into its own footprint? You have to place explosives near the columns and beams throughout the building and synchronistically set them off floor by floor. If you don't follow this precision, precise order, the building will fall over. And of course, that doesn't happen. Fire does not have this precision. How fast did the building co collapse? You can see it gaining additional distance with every second. It falls, admitted by NIST, in free fall acceleration. That means not, no resistance from any of the 80 columns in this building. Not one of them gave any resistance. It's as if eight stories were removed from this building all at once, resulting in feature number six, the total dismemberment of the steel structure, broken up, ready for loading and shipment. Four stories tall. How do you get 47 stories into four stories? Buildings that fall due to natural causes collapse. You can see a mangled building. Its structural members are not dismembered from each other. There's not a, its concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder. Do witnesses hear sounds of explosions? Feature number seven. I need sound. Kevin McPadden, former Air Force medic, cites explosions, like you'd hear the ground shaking, like, like you, the train run, running underneath your feet. Kaboom! I knew that was an explosion, he says. Do we have enormous pyroclastic-like clouds racing in every direction away from Building 7 at 35 miles an hour in, with expanding cauliflower-shaped plumes indicative of an incredible heat? Where does that heat come from? We'll take a look in a moment, but it didn't come from the few small scattered fires that you see here that are blamed for the collapse of this building. How about that, a heat? What's causing it? Well, FEMA author Jonathan Barnett, fire protection engineer, cites steel members in the debris pile that appear to have been partly evaporated in extraordinarily high temperatures. It takes 2,800 degrees to begin to melt steel. It takes 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit to evaporate it. Did that heat come from those few small scattered fires? We don't think so. We have the 10 key characteristic features of controlled demolition, direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire cannot create any one of these, let alone all 10 of them. If fire could have, it would have brought down this building, World Trade Center Building 5, completely engulfed in fire, did it? No, fire does not bring down steel frame or any other skyscraper, particularly these small few scattered fires. What happened to the evidence? Carted away at 400 truckloads a day beginning just two weeks after 9-11, put on barges, shipped to where? China for recycling before forensic investigators could get their hands on it. Bill Manning cites crucial evidence that can answer many questions on the slow boat to China. Do we have foreknowledge of this building's collapse? Listen to these construction workers hearing an explosion over their shoulder, looking back at building seven, and then looking straight into the CNN camera and saying this. I need sound. I say, did you hear that? Keep your eye on that building. That building's coming down. The building's about to blow up. Move it back. Flame and debris coming down. How do they know the building is about to blow up? Did we show, so far, the 10 key characteristics of controlled demolition? Is this direct evidence of explosive de destruction? Can fire create any one of these? No, let alone all 10 of them. We believe this is proof of controlled demolition, which is why we now have 2,800 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation who have also looked at the World Trade Center Twin Towers. 
We have plane impacts, but it's an hour to an hour and a half later that the towers came down. NIST acknowledges most of that jet fuel burned up in the first, well, outside the building. The rest of it was gone in 10 minutes. After that, for about an hour, we have normal office fires and some damage by the planes. They say that fire caused the sagging of these trusses, pulling in the columns, allowing that portion of the building above the jet plane impacts to crush the building and then crush itself. This is a theory that is completely contradicted by the evidence, particularly the evidence of the fires, which were going out at the time of these collapses, as you can see by, see by the thick, dark smoke clouds. Is there a sudden in onset of destruction? And what would produce that? Sounds and flashes heard and seen by witnesses, 118 of them documented in 2005 after a lawsuit forced the city to release this damning evidence of uh, observations of flashes, sounds of explosions, and other phenomena indicative of explosions, like this. Simultaneously, from all four sides, material shot out horizontally, momentarily de delay before you could see the collapse. An explosion in the South Tower, one floor under another. Figured it was a bomb because it looked like a deliberate, synchronized kind of thing. Seemed like on television when they blow up these buildings. Seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt. All these explosions. Let's see what they're talking about. The North Tower on the right. Known controlled demolition on the left. Is there any similarity? We'll slow it down halfway for you. Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since it looks exactly like a controlled demolition. Especially since fire, the official cause of these buildings collapse, along with jet, jet plane impacts, has never brought down a skyscraper ever. Somewhere in the middle of this World Trade Center, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Flash just kept popping all the way around the building, and the building had started to explode. Saw a brief number of light sources being emitted from inside the building between floors 10 and 15. I saw flash, flash, flash. Then it looked like the building came down. The building was blowing out on all four sides. We actually heard the pops. You know, you heard the pops of the building. With each popping sound, initially an orange, and then a red flash came out of the building. And then it would go all the way around the building on both sides. Let's look at the South Tower. Is there any similarity to a known controlled demolition which we're seeing on the left? The South Tower on the right looks exactly like a controlled demolition. Should it not have been examined? One of the first hypotheses of NIST, rather than completely ignored, especially with all the evidence of, ex of testimony of witnesses of explosions. I saw flash, flash, flash. Then it looked like the building came down. I thought the terrorists planted explosives somewhere in the building. That's how loud it was, a crackling explosive. These guys are saying boom, 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 just like a, a controlled demolition like you see on TV. Are firefighters credible? We think so. We're told the upper part of the North Tower crushed the rest of the building and then destroyed itself. But as you can see, in the first four seconds, it's destroying itself. It's as if a, a uh, it's, it's liquefying, it's telescoping. You can see it here quite easily, in fact. In the first four seconds, that upper part is telescoping in on itself. It is destroyed, dismembered. There's nothing left to crush the rest of the building at any speed. Let's take a look at the North Tower starting and now stopping. Just like you that we heard the firemen say, all the way around the building, symmetrical explosions. None of the photos or videos show an upper section of this building destroying the rest of the building. As you saw, it was gone. What it looks like is more like the volcanic eruption in the Tongan Sea in 2019. Upward, outward, arching streamers, followed by thick white smoke clouds which are indicative of incendiary destruction, a geometry of fireworks. Let's look at the South Tower. It does begin to tip over. So we have 20 degrees off center, 
asymmetrical damage from the loading of this building falling off of, of itself, asymmetrical damage from the jet plane damage, asymmetrical damage from the fires, how can it have symmetrical destruction all the way down from the top to the bottom in under 12 seconds? Just like the firefighters described, like a belt, all these explosions all the way around the towers. Take a look yourself as we zoom in on those explosions. Are we looking at a collapse or a series of thousands of explosions? And as we zoom in to feature number three, take a look at these individual isolated explosions called squibs here, here. These are coming out at 150 miles per hour, 200 feet per second, uh, 80 miles an hour. 60 floors down up to. These are pulverized building solids. You can see the solids uh, in, in these explosions. And this tells us, well, these are puffs of air being produced by that pile driver, which is driving down the building. But it was gone. You saw it was destroyed in the first four seconds. And if these were puffs of air, they'd blow out all the windows in an open office planning, which these floors were, not these individual uh, uh, charged isolated explosives that are in this engineered pattern, as you see here, often at the facade, 20, 40, 60 stories below. How fast is the building coming down? Let's take a look. Well, here's three seconds, four, five, six, seven. In under 12 seconds, the entire building is completely shattered, its structure from top to bottom. This is near free fall acceleration. The columns are not giving hardly any resistance. These columns, more steel in the facade than glass. What happened to it that it lost all of its resistance? How did it get totally dismembered? Feature number five of explosive demolition. Well outside the perimeter of each of the Twin Towers broken up into its original 37 and a half foot lengths, these core columns, laterally ejected feature number six in this case. As we proceed, freely flying structural steel sections, individually freely flying back to three, forward to three, back to three, forward to three. That's 45 degrees. It starts out laterally. What force in a gravitational collapse can send thousands of freely flying structural steel sections weighing four tons laterally, landing 600 feet in every direction, shot out at up to 80 miles per hour? Enough force to send a 200-pound cannonball three miles. And there are a lot of cannonballs coming out of here. And we're missing 110 floors that should have been stacked up at the bottom in some mangled fashion, but seen. Are they there? No. On the left, we see a two-story pile of core columns, perimeter columns, etc. On the right, in Mexico, we see what we ex expect to see, stacked up floor panels, 90,000 tons of concrete. What happened to it? It's not at the bottom. Oh, there it is being pulverized in midair by some extraordinary series of explosive forces. <laughs> pulverized 200 micron particles, laying four inches thick across lower Manhattan. What do they find in that pulverized concrete powder and, under, and in the pile, molten iron dripping from the molten steel, literally molten steel. Molten steel at the heart of the tower's remains. The firefighters are describing molten steel flowing like lava from a volcano. They don't see this in office fires. It takes 2,800 degrees to melt steel. Streams of molten metal that leak down the hot cores and flow down. Metal dripping from a beam. A river of steel flowing, says who? the structural engineer that designed these Twin Towers himself documenting this. 
flowing out of the material held in the hands of, this, of the, the jaws of this crab claw, pouring out of the South Tower 10 minutes prior to its collapse. Molten iron, we can tell by its color temperature, by its color, that it is not aluminum or lead or copper. This is iron. And it is very well documented, actually, in the case of Building 7 in the Appendix C of the Building Performance Assessment Report in 2002, a medical or metallurgical examination that uncovers uh, steel that's thin to almost razor sharpness, holes in the steel uh, up to a silver dollar, evaporation of the ends of the steel beam, an attack uh, of sulfur, eutectic reactions, and sulfidation, intergranular melting, the melting of uh, with iron, molten iron. Where does molten iron come from? Not from jet fuel. Jet fuel is only for five, six hundred degrees according to its manufacturer. But here we have the presence of sulfur attacking the steel. NIST says, well, that can't be sulfur. Uh, that, that must be the uh, s calcium sulfide inside the gypsum board. Well, we use gypsum board for almost 100 years to protect steel. It's never turned around and attacked the steel it's designed to protect. So what caused all this steel to melt? Well, let's look and see if there's evidence of thermite. Here's one possibility. The thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. It creates 4,500 degree temperatures in every, in every uh, uh, liquid molten iron, the byproduct of thermite. So here we have a possible source for the massive heat. We have a possible source for the liquid molten iron, and they find in it also, the, the scientists find sulfur, which is added to thermite to become thermate. So a possible source for the sulfur all in this material. So what else was found, though, in the dust throughout the powdered concrete throughout Mo the, the, the Manhattan? Liquid, uh, previously molten iron microspheres found by the USGS, billions of them. They don't know where they came from. They're the diameter of a human hair on average, almost naked to the hum human eye. And R.J. Lee, another environmental consultant, finds these. They're so ubiquitous, they call them a signature element. It's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has these spheres. Up to 6% of the dust is these unknown liquid, previously molten iron microspheres. They're everywhere. Well, here's how thermite reacts, a small experiment. Thousands of what? Aerosolized molten iron forming itself by surface tension into spheres, falling just as you see here. Well, that's found in the dust. They can't explain it. What else is found in the dust, though? Independently collected samples documented by a team of international experts from Stephen Jones in Utah, Niels Harrett in Copenhagen. They document four independently collected samples. What do they find? Red-gray iron, red-gray chips, uh, about a sixteenth of an inch long. There's up to 10 tons of this material. Here's the ones they documented. They come up to a magnet, so they get real curious, and they do a X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy. They find the ingredients of thermite, unignited thermite. So before we had the ingredients of ignited thermite in the iron microspheres, here we have ingredients of unignited thermite. They get real curious. They zoom in 50,000 times with an electron microscope. What do they find? Iron oxide crystals, aluminum platelets, set in an organic bed of oxygen, silica, carbon, very sophisticated material, an incendiary that's been engineered and set with organic material to become more explosive. And just like the results before them, at 420 degrees centigrade, about 800 Fahrenheit, they ignite. What do they produce when they ignite? Iron microspheres. So we know where the iron microspheres came from. They came from these chips. 
That's extraordinary, internally consistent, self-corroborating set of data that could put a lot of people away for a long time. As if we didn't know where these spheres came from, they're found attached to partially ignited nanothermite chips. It's called superthermite. It's made not in a cave in Afghanistan, only in the most sophisticated defense contracting laboratories. This is all documented in an peer-reviewed paper, Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. It's direct evidence of explosive destruction. Fire can create any one of these features, let alone all of them, especially these fires that were going out at the time of these buildings collapse. So we believe that we've demonstrated the 10 key characteristic features of controlled demolition, that fire can't create any one of them. We believe this is proof of controlled demolition, which is why we have 2,700 architects and engineers calling for a new investigation about the truth about 9-11. Thank you. One more time for Mr. Gage. Very powerful, very powerful. Now that we know that some Muslims in a cave in Afghanistan somewhere were certainly not capable of such a sophisticated uh, explosion and plan, then we have to ask ourselves, then who? Since we know it was not the Muslims, who's responsible for this heavily sophisticated plan, which is the mother of all false flag events? Well, as we said in the offset of this program, we not only want to uncover the lies, but we also want to uncover and pinpoint the liars. So to take us further, our last presenter is a, one of those allies that we have who will help us pinpoint who is behind and who is most responsible? Who are the culprits behind these activities? We have as our final presenter, Mr. Christopher Bolin. Bolin is a well-traveled writer and an investigative journalist who has done extensive research into the events of 9-11. As a thinker, he has been highly, highly critical of Israel and he was also part of the, um, uh, with Mr. Stephen Jones, who was one of those that found the thermite in um, the debris of 9-11. Now, consequently, that same year, for him being critical of being critical of Israel and the war on terror, he was attacked by a heavily armed group of police. Well, he's with us today and to take us further to expose the culprits behind this wicked atrocity. Help me to receive to the stage Mr. Christopher Bolin. Let's welcome him, family. Hello, can you hear me all right? It's great to be here. Salam Alaikum. I want to uh, recognize the great efforts of Minister Louis Farrakhan in being the only religious leader in our nation who has addressed the, the gigantic, horrendous fraud of 9-11. You see, 9-11, 9-11 was used to take us into an open-ended war against Islamic nations. And that's where this nation has been for the past 15 years. And not a, not a single religious leader other than Minister Farrakhan has had the moral compass to stand up and tell the faithful that we've been lied to. So I've written this book, Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. It's changed our world. 9-11 was carried out to kickstart the war on terror, a Zionist war agenda of aggression, terrorism, and conquest, which continues to this day. 9-11 was wrongly blamed on Muslims 
to trick us as a nation, as a world, into supporting an open-ended and criminal war agenda across the Islamic world. It's cost us more than $2.5 trillion, and we as people of conscience are obliged to resist the deception, as our religious leaders all should do. I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. when it happened, so it fell right into my lap. I was passing through New York City with my family when 9-11 happened. I grew up in Chicago, outside in a place called Schaumburg, Illinois. Here's my book, The Deception That Changed the World. 9-11 was a highly sophisticated false flag terror atrocity designed to create fear and rage in the people's hearts to compel U.S. public opinion to support the war on terror, which is an Israeli Zionist war agenda in disguise that we are supposed to fight. Starting the war on terror was the real reason for 9-11. 9-11 was, of course, a policy coup that brought us the war on terror and a series of wars like this one in Iraq. We've been deceived. We've been lied to. 9-11 was just the beginning. Starting the war of, ag of aggression was the real reason for the terrorism. We will not have peace as a nation or a world if we continue to accept the deception of 9-11. The media has been the key player in the deception. We've been lied to by the media. The media is complicit in the cover-up. They have imposed on the American public the false story that radical Islamic terrorists are to blame for 9-11. And the only way to liberate ourselves and our nations from this madness is to expose the true source of terrorism. The U.S. government on 9-11 called the, the war, the, the attacks, an act of war, which basically made it the military's business to seek justice for. So there was no actual criminal investigation. Larry Johnson from the State Department, Secretary, uh, D D Director of Counterterrorism, said these guys were extremely well organized, talking about the hijackers, the alleged hijackers. He said these guys were just committed zealots and willing to give it up without being key members of the network. They were told what to do, what to prepare for, what to train for. They were not the ones calling the shots. He said, we don't have anything in history to compare with this. The only thing that comes close to it is a former Soviet intelligence operation. So who pulled this off? Now, if the government and media are lying to us about 9-11, it means that they are controlled by the very same people who carried out 9-11. Now that's a very serious predicament. And Minister Farrakhan's the only person who's addressing it. Now 9-11 and the War on Terror have a common source. Both 9-11 and the War on Terror were conceived and planned in Israel in the 1970s by Israeli military intelligence. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the War on Terror. Nine days after 9-11, George Bush declared a war on terror, basically telling the world, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. The War on Terror has cost this nation over two and a half trillion dollars. Now, you can imagine how far that would go to supporting and helping the American people rebuild our infrastructure, support our communities. The war on terror is a fraud. You have as much likelihood in this nation of being a victim of terrorism as you do of being struck by lightning. But we're spending $400 million per year per victim of terrorism in this nation. Compared to cancer and, and influenza and heart disease, you would have to stack that bill, those bills up a thousand times higher to understand how much money. This is a fraud. So the fraudulent war on terror is all based on the 9-11 lies. 
Where did the war on terror come from? Where did Americans start to learn to treat people like this? Well, the war on terror, I'm going to talk about the evolution of an Israeli stratagem. Now, a stratagem is a, is a clever device to trick people into serving them. The war on terror is an Israeli stratagem, a ploy pushed by Benjamin Netanyahu since 1979 to trick the United States into waging war against Israel's enemies. Here he was in 1979, he, came, he worked for a Rothschild company called Boston Consulting. He went back to Israel and he started a Netanyahu Institute. The very first thing they did in 1979, they had a conference in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism. They tried to say that all international terrorism is a propaganda offensive. They said that all international terrorism was coming from the Soviet Union. And George Bush spoke at the final, Mr. Bush Sr. spoke at the final session and said that basically the idea of fighting terrorism was a great thing to do as a war. Now, Mr. Netanyahu is currently the Prime Minister of Israel. He has made a career out of promoting the war on terror, writing books like this. Now, he, Mr. Netanyahu, is from the Likud coalition, Likud. The Likud was created by the father of terrorism, a man named Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin, in 1977, became Prime Minister of Israel. And he was asked by a British journalist in 1974, Mr. Begin, how does it feel, in the light of all that's going on, to be the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Mr. Begin said, in the Middle East? He said, in all the world. So he put on himself the mantle of being the father of terrorism. You see, you have to understand that the state of Israel was born and created through terrorism. This is 1946. This is one of the first things he did as head of the Irgun. The Irgun is the mother party of the, of the Likud. He blew up the King David Hotel, killing 93 people. British, it was British headquarters during the British mandate period in Palestine. It's very, very similar to 9-11. Here he is, he came from Russia, came to Palestine, became the leader of the Irgun, bombed the King David Hotel, created the Deir Yassin massacre where they blew up buildings in a Palestinian village called Deir Yassin in order to scare the Palestinians that they would run away. And then he created the Likud party in 73, became prime minister in 77. That's when Israel changed from being a relatively a uh, peaceful country to becoming a vicious terrorist state, 1977. And the ideology of the Likud is based on this idea called Eretz Israel, Greater Israel. This idea that Israel should, should fill its, its biblical boundaries as they say God gave to the state of Israel. And so they have a, a much bigger idea of what Israel should be. And they are dedicated to reaching that state. That's very important to understand. This is, the, this is what they call what Israel's future borders should look like. And as Mr. Begin said, Jerusalem was and forever will be our capital. And Eretz Israel will be restored to the people of Israel. Now this is what Begin said in 1947, and this is exactly what the Likud still continues to, to say to this day. So here he became the president of the country, the prime minister of the country in 1977. This happened to be a time when I was living in Israel. They came to power, 77. Now one of his partners was this man, Yitzhak Shamir. And I, I want to point out that this is a, this is a member, this was the, the head of the Lehi, or the Stern gang. This was a gang of murderers. They killed the UN envoy, Volker Bernadotte. They killed rocket scientists. And his little gang called the Stern gang had a, a very interesting member who was this man's father. This is Ram Emanuel. He's the mayor of my hometown, Chicago. And his father was a member of the Stern gang when they killed that UN ambassador. Now here are some of the fathers of terrorism. This is a photograph from the Lavon Affair. The Israelis did a, a false flag terror attacks in Egypt back in 1954 in July. And it was run by these men here. On the, on the left is Shimon Perez, then Mr. Lavon, then Moshe Diane and his assistant. And they blew up, they put bombs in American and British libraries in Egypt with the intention of the, the blame being put on the Muslim Brotherhood. 
because Mr. the Prime Minister of, of Israel said after this event, he didn't know about it, but Shimon Peres had been running it. And he said Shimon Peres shares the same ideology. He wants to frighten the West into supporting Israel's aims. And that is exactly where we are here today with terrorism. They're trying to frighten us all the time into supporting their war agenda. But it's not our agenda, and it's not an American agenda. In 1948, before Israel became a state, the Joint Chiefs of Staff analyzed what this, this Israeli Zionist state, Zionism means Israeli nationalism, Jewish nationalism. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff said this, they wrote this in their 13th paper, they said, Zionist strategy will seek to involve the United States in a continuously widening and deepening series of operations intended to secure maximum Jewish objectives. And what were those maximum Jewish objectives? The expansion of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, into Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, and the establishment of Jewish military and economic hegemony over the entire Middle East. As you can see, that's what the United States has been doing for the past 15 years. Now, this is a, these were the strategic goals of the father of Israel, Ben-Gurion, who was another Rothschild employee. He said in 1948, after Israel became a state, he said we should go on the offensive and smash Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and then, and then take out Jordan, and Syria will fall, and if Egypt dares to resist, we'll bomb Cairo. This is the pre Prime Minister of Israel, one week after the nation became a state. This is, of course, what Israel did to the United States. Many people will say, oh, Israel wouldn't do that. They wouldn't attack us. Well, read your history, 1967. They attacked this ship, and they told, the Tel Aviv said, from the radio control said, identify the ship. The pilot said, it's American, American. Tel Aviv control said, sink the ship. No survivors. Now, a week after 9-11, this General Wesley Clark walked through the Pentagon and he said about 10 days after 9-11 I went to the Pentagon I saw Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and one of the generals called me in and he said we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq we're going to war with Iraq I he said why I don't know he said I came back a few weeks later he said and by that time we were bombing Afghanistan and he said are we still going to war with Iraq and the general said oh sir it's much worse than that we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. And as you can see, that shopping list is exactly what we've been doing for the past 15 years. Now, what's the master plan? It's a Zionist master plan to dominate the entire region by breaking up the large Arab countries into ethnic statelets. It's called balkanization. It's exactly what we did in Yugoslavia in the 1990s. We took a big country and broke it into little pieces, fracturing it along religious lines or ethnic lines. This is the, this is the plan that the Israeli Likud came out with, a man named Oded Yinon, in 1982. And thanks to Israel Shahak, it was a professor of chemistry, he translated it into English, and we now understand what the Israeli plan is for the Middle East. It's exactly what's happened to Iraq, to Syria, to Libya, to Sudan, to Somalia, to Yemen. All have been victimized by this plan, breaking them up. Who's behind it? Well, here we have a picture from the Pentagon. We have something called the Defense Policy Board. These are mostly Zionist men. Here we have Wolfowitz and Rabbi, Rabbi Dov Zakheim across the table and the Israeli boy uh, Douglas Fife, and they're sitting right next to the Israeli chief of staff in the Pentagon and he's telling them well this is what you should do and that's what we've done. They advise us, the Israelis tell our Pentagon what we should be doing. Here's Hillary Clinton and this is 2012 when she was Secretary of State and she wrote in that email, the best way to help Israel is to use force to overthrow the government in Syria. Where is there American interest in overthrowing the government in Syria? None. 
But this proves that, that Obama and, and Hillary Clinton were serving Israeli ends, not American. So 22 years after it was first promoted, this idea of a war on terror in Jerusalem, it became reality with 9-11. It was born. Now I'm going to talk about the Israeli connections to 9-11. Number one, ideation. The Israelis put out the idea that planes might be flying into big buildings one day. This is a film by a senior Israeli agent named Arnon Milchan, a Hollywood producer, a very high-level Israeli agent. He made this film in 1978 called The Medusa Touch, in which a large Boeing plane flies into the Pan Am building in New York City. This is from the movie. Now, is this coincidence or is this prescience? Now, the thing is that he's very close, and the picture shows him with, with the Defense Minister of Israel, Ezra Weizmann. This is at the very highest level of Israeli military intelligence. And here he's making the movie. Here he is, he's worth $5.2 billion, and you can see he's very close to the very highest level establishment in Israel, Shimon Peres and Bibi Netanyahu, two of the most notorious Israeli terrorists in history. Then, in the year 2000, with his business partner, Rupert Murdoch of Fox News, they made a program, a TV program called The Lone Gunman, in which a Boeing 740, a 757 is flown into the World Trade Center. And this was on TV in March 2001 on Fox News. 13 million people watched it. This is putting the idea out there into your mind that planes might be striking big buildings one day. Now, the next thing is the father of Israeli intelligence, this man Isra Harel, he predicted in 1979 that Islamic or Arabs would attack the tallest buildings in New York City. He predicted to this man, this uh, Jewish man here with Menachem Begin, and he said, he, Mr. Mr. Evans asked Harel, he said, Harel, do you think terrorism will come to America? And if so, where and why? Issa Harel said, yes, I fear it will come to you in America. America has the power but not the will to fight terrorism. As to where, Harel continued, New York City is the symbol of freedom and capitalism. It's likely they will strike your tallest building and a symbol of your power. 1979, 22 years before 9-11. Then number three, the Israeli Mossad got the security contract for the World Trade Center in 1987 because they actually intended that 9-11 would happen in the 1980s, but they were delayed because the Port Authority discovered that the man involved was not only an Israeli intelligence agent, but he was using a fake name. He was using a false name. They often do. So they tore up the contract, the Port Authority, the owners of the World Trade Center, they tore up the contract. Had they not done that, 9-11 would have happened, as I say, in the late 80s. But when those Israelis were, were thwarted, they didn't go back to Israel. They went to work with American Jews who, who were working in the World Trade Center, namely Jules Kroll and Maurice Greenberg. And in 1993, when the building was bombed the first time, Jules Kroll, the man at the top here, got the security contract for the World Trade Center. And at that time, that Israeli man that was the head of the Shin Bet was now working for him. So they used a Trojan horse to get into the, into the World Trade Center. Number four, Israel, Israeli military intelligence, created Al-Qaeda. They created the Islamic foe for the war on terror. Because if you're, if you're going to have a big war on terror, you have to have an enemy. So they have to create the enemy. So under Ehud Barak, in the 19, early 1980s, Israeli military intelligence trained a group in Pakistan of Afghan fighters and Arabs called Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, faction Hizb Islami. At this time, this is when the Afghan, what they call the Afghan Arabs, the Arabs came to Afghanistan to help the Afghan fighters against the Russian army, the Soviet army. And at, this is the time when Israeli military intelligence under Ehud Barak, this man on the left, was running the operation. The CIA was paying for it, and Saudi Arabia were paying for it. Pakistan was the host country, 
and Israel military intelligence was doing the training in the army. It was done by a guy named Charlie Wilson, a congressman from, from Texas. But the question was, why would the CIA and Israelis, why would they arm the most anti-Western group out there? Because they were creating the group that became Al-Qaeda and it had to be extremely anti-Western. The Mossad connection. Charlie Wilson was a congressman in Washington, but his, his handler was the head of Mossad in Washington, D.C., this man Zvi Rafia. He was the handler of Charlie Wilson since 1973. He managed him. And the, this Israeli agent used Charlie Wilson's congressional office as if it were his own. As you can see from the book here, Charlie Wilson's War, Rafia always acted as if he owned Wilson's office. And they, they together put together this operation. This is bin Laden's first trainer. He's a man named Ali Mohammed. He's a Hebrew-speaking Egyptian, if you believe that. And this man was involved in all of those terror attacks that happened in the 1990s. This man set up the, set up the cell in Nairobi that bombed the American embassies in Africa. This man trained the guy who killed Rabbi Kahane. And then after, and then he, and then he was, put in federal penitentiary, and he disappeared from federal penitentiary without a trace. Then the group, Gulbadin, that the Israelis had trained, became Al-Qaeda in 1994. They became Al-Qaeda. Now, if you understand the current situation with ISIS, Al-Qaeda then became ISIS. So it's the Israelis create this cadre, this group of terrorists, who then change names and change places, but they remain the target. So when America strikes ISIS, when America strikes Al-Qaeda, they're actually striking Islamic nations. They're striking, they're not hitting the enemy. They're fighting ISIS. They're hitting infrastructure, power plants, water plants, hospitals. <laughs> then this is about 1993, the first bombing in the World Trade Center. The first bombing in the World Trade Center, to my mind, was to put in your mind the idea that Arabs are trying to blow, blow up the World Trade Center. So the interesting thing that this narrative was given to us by an Israeli, Michael Sheratov, who was the prosecutor in this case in 1993, and Judge Michael Mukasey, a fellow Zionist, was the judge who oversaw the whole thing. Now, if you remember, the bomb went off and eight people died or six people died. And the FBI paid this Egyptian colonel here one million dollars to testify. He was the informant. He was the one who kind of like set these people up. The blind shake. The blind shake didn't blow up the World Trade Center. The FBI did. Here we have plan number six. It's the, the Zionist plan for the new Pearl Harbor. This was planned in advance. The, this man, um, Philip Zelikow, had a catastrophic terrorism study group in which they were imagining the transforming event that would change this nation. This was published two years before 9-11. Another one of the authors was Ashton Carter, top left, and the man with the blue sweater. These are Rothschild agents. These men, when they wrote that paper, were working for a group called Global Technology Partners, which is an exclusive affiliate of Rothschild North America. Their whole business is, is getting onto the gravy train of American defense spending. That's where the money is. They take the money from us, they put it into war, and the Rothschilds profit from it. And another group was PNAC, Project for a New American Century. They said that the process of transforming the American military into this worldwide dominant force would, would be a, a, a long change absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, which is exactly what 9-11 was meant to be. Now, this is another point. The Israeli Mossad controlled security at U.S. airports, the key U.S. airports, on 9-11. And the men that ran this company, ICTS, based in Holland, are these characters here. Mr. Shukerman, Yair Shamir, the son of Shamir, and Boaz Harel. It's a Rothschild company. They controlled passenger screening at Boston Airport, Newark Airport, etc. They controlled who got on the planes. Now, then again, Israelis created false histories for these men. Fifteen of these 19 supposed hijackers lived in Florida, where many of them had been given 
duplicate licenses, and others had reported having lost their passports. So what you have is a game where you have two people that are using the same identity. One is an Israeli agent that looks like him, and one is the person himself. In this way, they leave a fake trail for that person, incriminating him. This is explained in the very good book, The Little Drummer Girl, by John Le Carre. It's an Israeli plot. It's an Israeli action. This is what they do. They leave fake trails for people. They incriminate them. And in the book, the Mossad person says to this actress, terror is theater. Theater is a contract. Do you know what that means, contract? You've been deceived. 9-11, in July 2001, Zionists got the lease for the World Trade Center. Zionist is, again, Israeli nationalist, people who believe in Israel over everything else. It's a political ideology. It's not a religion, it's not a race, it's not an ethnicity. It's a political ideology, flat and simple. Now, how that happened, how did Larry Silverstein get the World Trade Center is very interesting. He got it through Ronald Lauder. Ronald Lauder, the son of Estee Lauder, he was in charge of the privatization scheme for New York State. And in this scheme, they decided to privatize the World Trade Center. Now, Mr. Lauder also funds a school at Mossad University in Israel called the IDC. And at the IDC, the person who runs his school is Major General Danny Rothschild. The Rothschilds, the Rothschild family of Britain and France, they built Israel. They paid for Israel. They built the first 30 settlements. The first one is called Rishon Letzion, the first in Zion. That's where Danny Rothschild was born. So they, they made a few children as well to carry on the family genes. Now, what's the connection between Larry Silverstein and the buildings? Well, the Port Authority owned the World Trade Center. The Port Authority was headed by this man, Lou Eisenberg, another Zionist. There were some very convoluted negotiations in the summer of 2001 and the World Trade Center passed to Larry Silverstein. These two men are on the board of the United Jewish Appeal, the largest funding organization for the State of Israel in the United States of America. So it was the Zionist connection that got the building to Larry Silverstein. Larry Silverstein also happens to be a very close friend of Bibi Netanyahu. This is from the Israeli media. For years, Netanyahu and Silverstein have kept in close touch. Every Sunday afternoon, New York time, Netanyahu would call Silverstein. It made no difference where Netanyahu was, he would always call. And their ties continued after Netanyahu became prime minister. What were they talking about every Sunday afternoon for years? Well, finally, Larry Silverstein, on July 24th, he got the Twin Towers in his hand. And then he controlled everything about the building. The first thing he did was he jacked the, he jacked the, the, rent, the rent up 40% and insured it against terrorism. This is what was left five weeks later of the World Trade Center. All that was left was steel and dust. And on September 11th, the Israeli military chief Ehud Barak, the one who had trained Osama bin Laden, came on the BBC. He happened to be in London. He happened to be in the studio of the BBC World Television, the largest television network in the English-speaking world. And he said this. He said, it's time to launch an operational, concrete war against terror. He said the world will never be the same from today on. And he blamed Osama bin Laden. What's the connection here? Ehud Barak was the commander of Bibi Netanyahu in a covert commando force called the Sayeret Matkal. This is a covert independent commando force that serves directly under the Israeli chief of staff and military intelligence. On 9-11, this man in, with the New York Police Department hat, his name is Ehud, Ehud Olmert, former Prime Minister of Israel. He was in New York City on September 10th and 11th, but his presence was kept out of the news completely. Why? What was he doing in, in September 10th and 11th in New York City that had to be kept secret? Here he is with Bibi Netanyahu. Here he is nine days later, 10 days later, comes and sits next to Mr. Giuliani. You see New York City and Jerusalem our sister cities. And this man was the mayor of Jerusalem. And he comes to New York City, and it's not reported. It would usually be front page news. Then 
the Israeli son of the Mossad, Michael Sheratov, this man here, controlled the 9-11 investigation. He was put in charge. He was the assistant attorney general. He was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11. But they didn't even investigate the crime. There has never been an investigation of 9-11, full stop. John Ashcroft put Michael Sheratov in charge of the investigation. And then what he did, he oversaw the destruction of evidence, the destruction and confiscation of the critical evidence. It was a cover-up from the very beginning. Then George Bush made him head of Homeland Security, number two, in which position he remained in charge of the evidence. Then 13, the Zionists, Zionists controlled junkyards, two of them in New Jersey. They managed the destruction of the evidence. The evidence was taken to their junkyard, cut into small pieces, mixed with other scrap, and shipped to Asia. At a time when the price of scrap steel was the lowest it had been in 50 years, this was destruction of evidence. This was not business. This is a pile of, of steel. All the steel was destroyed. And then the Zionists, a Zionist again is a supporter of Israel, they presided over the 9-11 lawsuits and tort litigation. There were 3,000 victims. That was a lot of litigation. It all went to this man, Judge Alvin K. Hellerstein in Manhattan. Now there's a problem here. His son is a lawyer in Israel who works for the key defendant in the 9-11 litigation, that company I told you about, ICTS, the people who were responsible for this passenger screening at the airports. If those 19, if those 19 hijackers got on the plane, they would know how they got on. Conflict of interest was his son was working, as I said, for the parent, for the law firm that over, that controlled that ICTS company. So that's a primary family conflict of interest. You cannot, a judge cannot oversee a case when his son or his wife is working for the defendant. That's completely not right. And then we had, as I said, 3,000 victims. The first 2,900 victims were given money out of the com compensation fund which was managed by Kenneth Feinberg, another Zionist. He, he gave the money to the people, then they had to sign a line where they wouldn't, disc they wouldn't allow, they wouldn't ex talk about how much money they got or the terms. There were 100 families left. They held out for a court process, and they were treated with Sheila Birnbaum. One by one, every single family was settled out of court. So all 3,000 families were settled out of court, and there has not been one day in court for a single 9-11 victim. That's not justice. This is Judge McCasey. This is the fellow Zionist judge who oversaw the, 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 the court process in the 1993 bombing. And he then oversaw Larry Silverstein's insurance claim with the insurance companies, where Larry Silverstein got paid twice for the destruction of his buildings. He made from $100 million of a down payment with borrowed money he got something like $5 billion. The 15th point is Benjamin Netanyahu admits that 9-11 benefits Israel. He said on 9-11 to the New York Times, he was asked, how will this affect Israeli-American relations? And Netanyahu said, it's very good. It will generate immediate sympathy. Who would say it's very good when there are 30,000 people who are thought to be in the rubble dead? A couple years later, he said in Hebrew, speaking to an Israeli audience, he said, we are benefiting, we are benefiting from one thing, and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Israel is benefiting from that, not America. And then the point that the Zionists control the myth. They wrote the myth. This man, Philip Zelikow, was in charge of the 9-11 Commission, and he wrote, this, he wrote the outline for the report before the people even began working on the report. And this man's specialty, he went to school, he's a Zionist. He went to school and he, he got a master's degree or a PhD in on the creation and maintenance of the public myth. Because what we've been sold is a myth. We've been told a myth that Islam is trying to attack our nation. And unfortunately, Donald Trump still supports that myth. He was in Tampa the other day and he said radical Islamic terrorists are, are determined to attack this nation as they did on 9-11. That's false. And for Donald Trump to say that that's the case is a very, very dangerous thing.
And here's the, the people who worked on the report. They said, this is the John Farmer, the counsel for the report. He said, what the government told us about what, the, what Congress, what they told Congress, the commission, the media, and the public about who knew what when was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. And these are the commissioners themselves, Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton. Thomas Keene said, to this day, we don't know why NORAD told us what they told us. It was just so far from the truth. So the American people have been given a pack of lies about what happened on 9-11. And it's, it's time we wake up from this nightmare. And my last point is that then is, in, if you go to New, Ground Zero, if you go to New York City, there's a big memorial there, and there's a strange building called the Oculus, and there's a shopping mall, and they, and they have these water, these ponds, and there's, names are carved in granite around the ponds. This was designed and given to us by the Israelis. The Israeli engineer, the Israeli designer who built it is this man here. The World Trade Center Memorial was designed by a friend of the Netanyahu family. His name is Michael Arad. He's the son of Moshe Arad, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. This is how they want to control the story. They give you the idea for the story, they control the story, they make it happen, and then they control the legacy. So they, young American kids go to this ground zero and they go through a museum that's run by Israelis, built and, and run by Israelis, to teach them the lie that Islam did this to America. Here's Mayor Bloomberg talking to Netanyahu. They're discussing the four Israelis who died in 9-11. This is 10 years after the fact. Now, the critical thing is that the media has been lying to us. This is the, Washington, this is the New York Times, a Zionist-owned newspaper, family of the B'nai B'rith. Three years after 9-11, they came out with this editorial of the, of the paper, and they said, in the three years since 9-11, we've begun to understand that it's possible to know what happened without knowing what happened. How Orwellian is that? And for 15 years, the controlled media has pushed the false story about 9-11 and the war on terror, all the while suppressing all evidence that disproves the official myth. Why does the media do this? Because we have today, almost all of the media in this country is owned by six companies. And those six companies are owned by the Rothschilds. Here we have media moguls like Rupert Murdoch, who push the lies about 9-11 and the war on terror. They are complicit in a criminal cover-up with the people who did 9-11. Now, the Rothschild banksters create people like Mr. Murdoch so they control all the public opinion in this country. That's what the media in the country today, in, the, in NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, it's psychological warfare against the American people 24-7. And this is my final slide. This is summing up the, uh, my analysis. And this is from Dr. Alan Sabrosky, uh, who, who wrote this paper called Treason, Betrayal, and Deceit, 9-11 Beyond. And he said the evidential trail for 9-11 and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq runs from PNAC, APAC, the Israeli lobby and their cohorts, through the mostly Jewish neocons in the Bush administration, and back to the Israeli government. None of the denials and political machinations can alter that essential reality. And that's what I'm saying, is that we've been fooled, we've been tricked, we've been deceived into a war, and this is not our interest at all. This is an Israeli war agenda that we have been tricked into fighting. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum. Very powerful, very powerful. Let's hear it for him one more time. Excellent. Excellent. Man, that was awesome. And, and again, let's thank all of our presenters and certainly thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for inviting our guests to share this very clear and lucid data with us. I don't think that it's a coincidence that the same groups and entities who are truly responsible for 9-11 and the atrocities that have come afterwards just so happen to be the same groups, entities, and persons who antagonized the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan 
claiming he's an anti-Semite, hoping that the public would not listen to the truth coming from this divine man. So brothers and sisters, because of time, we are going to have to limit the questions that we do right now to one or two, maybe one from social media and one coming from the audience. However, our guests will be in the back of the room. They have their products and publications available, and they will be more than happy to uh, accept your questions and comments, as well as have some contact information to stay uh, with these brothers and sisters, to stay connected with us. We have Brother Jesse, who is on deck. Come on out, Brother Jesse, if you have the opportunity. Let's welcome our general. You could call him our press secretary, but I think press secretaries aren't having a good name right now. So let's be, bring him to our podium, Brother Jesse Muhammad. Hi, so Malaykum. I want to let you all know with great excitement that we have the hashtag war on Islam trended nationally at the number one spot during today's presentation. So this is being talked about all around the country and the world. All praise is due to Allah. So the Farrakhan Twitter army is at work right now. We have one question from social media, where well, we have many, but one in particular that has been asked over and over again that we want to present to the presenters is, how do we make these perpetrators pay for this and what does justice look like in this case? What would justice look like? You want to take that one? Here. Okay. I don't know if it's on or not. Is it on? Yeah. What would justice look like? Uh, justice would be the revealing exposure and prosecution of the people who did 9-11 and the people who covered it up and tricked us into war. That's fast. Okay, he said, yeah, we have time for one more. The second question is, in this age of fake news versus real news, how can we spot a false flag? How can we what? How can we spot a false flag? Oh, go ahead. One of the best ways to spot a false flag is when something happens, you listen to what the eyewitnesses say. Like in San Bernardino, there were some women who saw the shooters, and they said on national television, in the very morning, they said there were three tall white guys who were dressed in black who were doing the shooting. And at the end of the day, they, they had a dead Pakistani, short Pakistani brown-skinned woman on the ground, dead in handcuffs, and they said she had done it. Now that doesn't make sense. And when, when, when the eyewitness testimony does not make sense with what the government or the media is telling you, you can be pretty sure there is a false flag. Short and powerful, short and powerful. Brothers and sisters, before you leave, we definitely want to make sure that we all stay connected. We cannot allow this to be a wonderful event where all of this powerful information was shared, but we don't continue this movement and continue a sense of activism. One thing we can all do is make sure that we stay connected with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who's going to be delivering the keynote address tomorrow at the Joe Louis Arena a very timely address. Have no fear for the future now. The future is ours. Of course, stay connected with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on Twitter, um, Facebook, and Instagram, and all of his social media sites. Um, also, we want everyone to make sure that you connect and stay updated with this information this movement and this level of activism on NOI.org slash 9-11 Revisited. Again, that's NOI.org slash 9-11 Revisited. We have continuous workshops that will be taking place. Matter of fact, our Ministry of Defense workshop is going to be taking place in the Grand Ballroom. So when you leave here, make sure that you stay up on your P's and Q's uh, as we are literally at war. Wouldn't you agree with that? So we can't remain idly by. So we're going to conclude this portion of the program. Again, please see our panelists, our presenters at the end 
of the room where they have their own books and publications. Thank you so, so much. Happy Savior's Day.